In this episode, we will meet the Fairy King, Gwynap Neil, who resides on the top of Glastonbury Tour. You've likely heard the name before, as Glastonbury is not only the home of the famous music festival, it is also regarded as being the location of the mystical Isle of Avalon from Arthurian legend. Surrounded by countryside, the town is full of interesting and unique shops that reflect the new age and neo-pagan communities that are based there. But I hope you brought some sturdy footwear with you, because we must travel on through the town centre and up the steep slope of Glastonbury Tor. Tor is an old word of Celtic origin, meaning hill, and Glastonbury Tor is a hill that protrudes from the Somerset levels around it. It is a stunning feature of the area and can be seen from 20 miles away. The roofless tower that sits atop it is the ruin of St Michael's Church, the second to be built on that site, and was demolished during 1539's dissolution of the monasteries. The tour is a sacred site, and many people make the pilgrimage to the famous landmark from all around, as it has strong links to many religions and ancient legends. From here, we can look down at the beautiful countryside below, with trees and lush green spaces sprawling towards the horizon from miles around. Enjoy the view and the story of St. Cotheline and the King of the Fairies. St. Cotheline was an abbot who was based in the magnificent abbey in Glastonbury. He had spent much of his life traveling, but eventually he had decided that he wished for a more peaceful, steady life. And so he set up a humble dwelling on the side of Glastonbury Tor, perhaps near to the sacred waters of the Holy Chalice Well. Cotheline was enjoying his new life in the beautiful Somerset countryside. But as time passed, he began to overhear talk that concerned him greatly. He had heard the name before, discussed only in whispers. But today he overheard two men brazenly talking about the fairy king, Gwynap Neve. It had been a long time since he'd heard talk of such a creature. And after having dedicated much of his life opposing old pagan beliefs, to hear such talk of a fairy right outside his cell of all places was an insult. The men seemed to hold the creature in such high regard, to worship him even. This was far too much for the abbot to handle. He stormed out of his cell and confronted the men. Who were they to talk of such a demon? The men warned Cothelin, saying that he should know better than to talk ill of the fairy king. But Cothelin was unimpressed and shooed the men away. Time passed and he thought no more of the fairy king. That was, of course, until later, when a loud knock reverberated around his cell. He answered the door, and before him stood a fair-haired man, his hands covered by what looked like two mauve foxglove bells. The visitor confirmed that he was at the dwelling of Cothlin, and then proceeded to recite a message. Cothlin's presence was requested at the top of Glastonbury Tor by the order of Gwynap Neve, King of Anun and the Fairies. Cothlin shook his head. He would not humour this unwanted visitor. Word of his encounter with the men before must have spread and now they had sent another one of their comrades to mock him. Well, he would not indulge them in their frivolous pranks. The door closed on the fair-haired man. But the next day, there was another knock at the door. The same man had returned and the message was repeated. Again, Cothlin shook his head and sent the man on his way. But it was the third visit from the fair-haired man that shook the abbot to his core. The messenger had returned, but his tone had completely changed. This was no longer a kind request, but an order. If Cothelin did not meet with the king, terrible things would happen. The abbot's eyes widened, a fear sparked within him. And once the messenger had departed, he filled a flask with holy water and immediately began the steep trek up to the tor. It appeared to him at first in a haze, but soon, as he climbed higher and higher, the glistening turrets and glass-like exterior of the fairy castle appeared to him in the distance. Sweet music filled the air, and the men and women of the court stood to greet him in the castle's grounds, dressed in burning red and glistening blue. Their faces melded into an enchanting vision of eternal youth. White horses brayed beside them, but there, at the top of the castle, waving to him like an old friend, was a man who beckoned for the abbot to enter. Cothlin marched on through the castle door, chanting to himself softly to keep his mind clear of the illusions of this fairy enchantment. The king sat comfortably on his golden throne. He greeted Cothlin with a smile, welcoming him like an old friend. He encouraged his guest to make himself comfortable. Cothlin clutched the flask of holy water beneath his habit and little tighter. The king remarked that Cothlin must be hungry after his long trek. Perhaps he would care to join him for a feast. Whatever delicacies his heart desired, the king could have prepared for him. Succulent meats, plump fruits, fine wine, 
Anything could be conjured up right away. But Cothlin knew better than to accept the forbidden fruit of the fairy world, and he remarked that he would not dare to eat even the leaves off the trees. No matter, thought the king. He began to boast of his riches and the stunning red and blue garments that were sported so elegantly by the men and women of the court. The warmth of the reds and the icy tinge of the blue was almost intoxicating enough to send feverish flushes through the senses, even from Cothnan's distance. But he was under no illusion of the significance of this fairy dress, for the red symbolised the wretched heat and the blue the dismal cold of hell. And with that declaration, he flung his holy water at the king and his fairy court. They screeched and squealed and then melted into nothingness. The court, the king and the castle itself. The frivolity of the fairy court was no more, thought Cothlin as he stood alone upon the barren, wind-stricken tour. So that was the story of St. Cothlin and the King of the Fairies. My retelling was based on the version told in Pagan Portals by Danu Forrest, as well as the version in New Light on the Ancient Mystery of Glastonbury by John Michel. But the story itself is thought to have originated from the 16th century manuscript, The Life of St. Cothlin, which is spelt C-O-L-L-E-N. There is debate on whether this tale originates from Glastonbury or Wales, where the Welsh abbot originally came from. However, there does appear to be evidence that Cothlin was an abbot of Glastonbury Abbey in the 7th century, so his connections with the town are clear in a historical sense. Glastonbury Tour takes a prominent role in several other myths. One of the most famous claims that King Arthur's final resting place is within a cave in the hill. Danny Forrest proposes an interesting theory and suggests that perhaps Cothlin didn't destroy the fairy castle at all and was simply banished from it for his disrespect, as it is commonly noted that fairies have the power to only appear to humans of their choosing. Another traditional fairy theme that appears in the story is the apparent danger that comes from a human sampling food from the fairy realm, which is a motif that often appears in similar folktales and can perhaps be linked to the pomegranate seeds in Greek mythology that bind Persephone to the underworld. This is also a good example of how Christianity began to overlap with, absorb and perhaps even vilify traditional pagan deities, traditions and beliefs. So, what do you think? Did Gwynap Neath truly hold his fairy cause atop Glastonbury Tour? Or was this all a religious fable, warning against the pagan beliefs of the past? I'll let you decide. I started a tradition several years ago of visiting Glastonbury Tour to welcome in the autumn season and get a final glimpse of the green trees before they begin their autumnal transformation. It really is a beautiful place and definitely has a kind of magic and spiritualism about it. The climb to the top of the tour is also really enjoyable, and often there are several grazing sheep to keep you company on the way. If you'd like to take a break from our virtual trip and visit the tour for yourself, then you can take the signposted route from Glastonbury High Street, up past the ancient chalice well, and onto the top of the tour, where Gwynaf Neath is supposed to reside. The area is a National Trust site, but is free to visit. Thank you so much for visiting Somerset with me today. This part of the country holds such a special place in my heart, it's where I grew up and where my family still live to this day, so it was really lovely to share some local stories with you. I know I will certainly be visiting Somerset again soon, but I hope that you will too. Anyway, we've come to the end of our journey and it's time for me to leave you. So, until next time, goodbye.